This happened to me when I was about four years old and still living with my family in San Diego, California. It was a summer morning, and as was customary for my family on the weekends, it was decided we'd go to the closest swap meet to do some shopping right after having breakfast at our favorite pancake place. Before I share my account of what happened on this day, I need to make two things clear. First one is that I'm a female and even though I'm Caucasian, having very curly black hair has often made people think I'm Hispanic or perhaps biracial. And secondly, there were two things that always, and I mean always, made my father distracted whenever we'd go out. Woman and tools. Now, on the day in question, my father was looking for some specific tool he needed to work on some armoire or something. It was something he'd been asked to make for a client. My heavily pregnant mother had decided it was time to buy the last item she needed for the baby before she could go into emergency labor. To save time, my mother and my eight-year-old brother stayed behind to check baby stuff in one of the stands closest to the food court. It was right in the middle of the place. Because my brother was older, he'd been assigned the role of man of the house while my father took care of his shopping, which left me under the care of my father. My father took me with him to check the tool stand that was located at the opposite end of that row. As expected, and despite my mother warning him several times that morning not to let go of my hand as he'd done the previous week, I'd gotten lost inside a department store because he'd gotten distracted. He let go of my hand as soon as a young lady asked if she could help him with anything. He pointed to a toolbox that had caught his eye and went around the table as she offered to open it so he could check out the tools inside. Well, I felt bored just standing there. I turned around to see if my mother was still checking the baby items, thinking perhaps I could just go with her instead of staying with my father and looking at all this boring stuff. I couldn't see her or my brother anywhere though. I stayed in that same spot waiting because I'd been told the week before to stay put so it would be easier to find me if my father inevitably forgot about me again. As more and more time dragged on without my father checking up on me, I soon realized he probably was not going to come back. I looked around, but he was nowhere to be seen. The young lady who had helped him before was still there, but now she was talking to another customer. Still though, I waited a little bit longer thinking perhaps he'd just gone to the van beside the stand to check out any other tools kept in there. I was feeling increasingly scared by this point, so I took a few steps into the stand and called out for my father. It seemed he wasn't there anymore. At this point, the only thing I could assume was that he'd forgotten all about me again and left me behind. I walked back to the stand where my mother and brother had been, but they were no longer there either. I began to wander around looking for anybody, but I couldn't see them in any of the stands I passed by. To make things even worse, that day the swap meet was absolutely packed, so it was hard to see anything with all the adults towering above me. To this day, I don't know how I managed to stay calm and find my way to the side entrance, where my father had parked a car at least. Before I continue on, I'll say that even though I am a girl, my parents often dressed me in clothes that no longer fit my older brother. We were kind of poor and it was cheaper to have their daughter just wear their eldest son's clothes instead of getting new ones. That day, I was wearing some denim overalls, a white t-shirt with yellow lines on the sleeves and chest, and a pair of brown Oxfords instead of my usual Mary Janes. Due to being so curly, untamable, and short, I was often mistaken for a boy. I was waiting by the entrance watching the people that were leaving when a Hispanic woman in her 30s or 40s made a beeline straight towards me. She began to act overly dramatic, calling to me in this annoyingly sweet voice. She tried to pull me into her arms and kiss me a couple of times, but I turned away and clung to the metal pole that was behind me. I've never really been a people person, so touchy-feely people always made me feel the most uneasy. Another thing worth mentioning is that whenever I felt scared or threatened, I immediately went into fighting mode. Of course, at that moment, I was feeling extremely scared by this woman's antics. I began to slap and push her away and scream, don't touch me, 
to stop her from grabbing me or picking me up, as she was currently attempting to do. People stopped and stared, but did nothing to stop her or help me. She turned to them and told them in broken English that I was just throwing a fit, or something along those lines. Apparently, that was enough for everyone to just walk on by. At this point, I was sure no one would take the time to help me, which made me think I had to get out of this on my own. I began to act more aggressively, screaming louder to try and get any attention. The woman then yanked me away from the pole so hard my arms let go. She tried to pull me towards the parking lot. This is when I began to bite and kick, screaming for my mother and father as loudly as I could. This is when an elderly couple rushed up to me. Darling, are you alright? What's the matter? I told them this woman was not my mother, and she wanted to take me somewhere I did not want to go. The old man picked me up as the old lady left to call security. The woman kept trying to pull me by my clothes and legs, but the man was much stronger than her. Two younger men finally walked over and restrained the woman. I remember the old man wearing a cap with an eagle and flags on it, and I asked him what that meant. He began to tell me about it to distract me, while ignoring that crazy woman who was still screaming after me like a banshee. Mr. Ralph was telling me a story about all the medals he'd won during the war, when I heard my mother calling out for me, almost out of breath somewhere behind us. I saw her rushing over to us, dragging my brother along. Mr. Ralph put me down and explained the entire situation to her. It took my father even longer to show up, popping up out of nowhere white as a ghost when he saw the police officers talking to my mother and the elderly couple. My mother was of course furious and gave him quite an earful for being an irresponsible shit yet again. My parents thanked the couple and the officers for their help, and we left the swap meet immediately after. The crazy Hispanic woman was put into a patrol car and taken into custody. I'm not really sure what happened to her after that. I'm a Canadian student, female and in my early 20s, studying in the UK. Currently, I'm traveling home to see my family. I typically fly out of Manchester, as it's simpler to get from northern UK where I'm living. I found a cheap flight though that leaves early tomorrow, or today I guess, that I couldn't pass up. Problem is, it takes quite a few hours to get to the airport from where I currently live so I ended up having to take the train from downtown London to Gatwick Airport from 2 to 3 a.m. I mostly waited alone for an hour for my train to arrive, but about 20 minutes beforehand, a guy came in and sat down on a bench about 20 feet away from me. Immediately, I could sense a bad vibe from him, but I figured, hey, there's security cameras all around. Plus, he was far enough away that I just kind of ignored him. The train arrived at 2 a.m., and the journey there takes just over an hour. As it pulled up, I had this urge to just walk away from this man and sit in a different compartment with more people. When I turned to walk away, though, he gestured as to help with my bags, and I ended up getting into the compartment that pulled up in front of us. There was only that man and one other in the compartment with me, neither one with luggage. That struck me as kind of odd for a train that only headed to the airport. One of the men was sitting a few rows in front of me, and one a few rows behind. I felt very uneasy at this point, and slightly trapped. I decided to keep an eye on the man in front of me by watching his reflection in the window. I noticed he kept on muttering things to himself, sneaking glances over to me and smirking. He had multiple short phone conversations in a hushed voice as well. The man behind me seemed to be doing similar things too. After a few stops, another man got onto that same car, which did calm my nerves. Immediately though, I noticed that the man in front of me now seemed very aggravated. He moved seats to a row closer to me. Now with an eyeline, he pretended to read a book while staring at me intermittently over the top of it. He was close enough now also that his next phone conversation, I could make out the phrase, yeah, but not now. There was one stop left before the airport, and the third man got up to get ready to exit. I can't explain the feeling of fear I felt, thinking I'd be left alone in this compartment with these two men. 
I fumbled with my keys to get them between my fingers, in the horrible case I'd have to fight them off alone. The man in front of me got up again and moved behind me a row away from where the other man was sitting. I could hear a faint, yeah, let's go for it. At this point, I saw my opportunity, and I guess my body decided on flight rather than fight. I picked up all my bags and rushed out past the man who was also getting off and into the next compartment. Thankfully, there were a few people there and I was able to relax a bit. When we arrived at the airport, I tried to stay with the group getting off, as I knew the other two men would be exiting as well. Unfortunately, in my confusion finding the way to the terminal, the man from in front of me caught up with me. I veered off over by some station employees and dawdled there while I waited for the man to leave. He kept on looking over at me as he paced around back and forth before eventually leaving. I watched him travel up the escalator, staring at me the entire time he ascended. I waited for a minute and figured he must have given up by now, so I stepped onto the escalator as well. As soon as I reached the top, though, I saw the man standing there staring at me, waiting. I quickly shouted to another employee, asking if they would show me the way to the terminal. Thankfully, it was quite close by, and I was soon in the safety of the airport. Obviously, there's no way to know if I was just being paranoid since nothing happened, but I sincerely believe there's something just built into our genetics that lets us know we're in danger. I'm not typically a paranoid person, and I was not originally nervous about traveling there alone either. I was not scared or uneasy around any of the other people I encountered that night. Something about these two guys, though, told me I needed to get the fuck out of there fast, and I'd rather have overreacted in the end than ended up in a dangerous situation. A few years back when I was in my mid-teens, I was the rebellious type, or so I thought I was. I wore a lot of black clothing and tight jeans, long hair, the whole I hate my parents outfit. Above everything else though, I loved music. I've been a musician for eight years now, and I attribute this cringe-worthy time in my life to sparking that love. Well, with this love came the love of also seeing live shows. I would go to concerts whenever I could with whoever I could get to go with me. This was an October night when I went into the city of Philadelphia with my close friend who we'll call Sarah. We arrived at around 5 p.m. when the street was still very active and many people walked up and down, moving from one way to the other. This was a fairly safe time for two 15-year-old kids to be alone in a possibly dangerous city. We arrived at the show, went, and had a very great time. Nothing really important to note, just pure fun all around. After the final note had been played, it was around 11 p.m. or so. We left the venue and entered the now darker, colder city streets. To give some perspective, we had seen a show at the Barbary, which if anyone knows this place would know it's not in the best part of town. Instead of being smart and heading off with the crowds towards the train station home, me, a skinny 15-year-old boy, and Sarah, an even smaller 15-year-old girl, decided it would be a good idea to go out on our own and try to find some food. After walking around for what seemed like forever, we ended up at a small, run-down pizza shop. We both ordered our food and sat down to eat, talking about Sarah's recent breakup and how she'd never love again, all that kind of teenage gossip. After we finally moved on to brighter topics and things lightened up a bit, Sarah was in the middle of telling me some kind of corny joke, when she suddenly stopped mid-sentence, her eyes seemed in a way to go from me to somewhere behind me, and her smile changed to an expression of worry. I noticed and asked her what was wrong. That seemed to break her from the trance she was stuck in. That guy a few tables down. Her voice trailed off for a moment, and just as I was about to press her to continue, she spoke up again, this time with a more upset tone. He's masturbating under the table and staring at me. For a short moment, I thought she was making a stupid joke, but seeing the look in her eyes, I could tell she was serious. Alright, come on, let's go, now, I said. I wanted to get Sarah as far away from this guy as possible. We quickly threw away our trash and left, 
and walked swiftly down the now dark and empty city streets. After a block or so and no sign of that man trying to follow us, we relaxed a little bit, falling back into our normal conversation. The situation was fairly quickly forgotten. We had been talking about some form of high school drama or other, when Sarah suddenly stopped once more. She saw the man. He was two blocks up, and if the streets had not been so empty, we probably would have never taken notice of him. That's him, she said, the fear welling up in her throat. It took me a second to realize the situation we now faced. There stood the man, much taller and larger than I thought he was back in that poorly illuminated pizza shop. He was just hitting his head against the wall, not hard enough to hurt it looked like, but enough to the point where it was making a noticeable noise. We stopped dead in our tracks and just stared at him, both of us trying to make sense of what we were seeing. This is when I started to hear what he was saying. He was muttering something unintelligible with the louder yell of some curses in between. Look, I know this is freaky, but it's going to be okay. We can go around the other side of the block and pass him by, I said, trying to restore some normality to this otherwise disturbing situation. Sarah was still noticeably scared, of course, but was somewhat calmed by the reality of this obvious route around. With this, we continued our walk toward the train station, which would take us to safety. At this point, I was fighting the thoughts in my head and trying to stay calm. You see, I was familiar with the response time for police in this part of Philadelphia. At this time of night, it was 30 minutes at best, which meant if we were actually in any danger, we were all on our own. We reached the end of the first block, and it was at this point I began to hear the man again, now much more clear. I could make out more of what he was saying. He was talking to himself in an angry tone, seemingly pissed off about messing something up. I should have just done it, he kept repeating. At this point, we were beyond freaked out and just wanted to get home and remain undiscovered. Now, we were only a few feet away from him, but on the opposite side of the block when the man grew violent, he began to smash his head into the wall harder and yell louder, I should have done it! Over and over again. Sarah, who now had tears welling in her eyes, let out the faintest scared yelp. The man stopped dead in his tracks and everything grew silent. We heard the man turn and laugh ever so slightly, and then start running away. Thinking quickly though, I realized he was not running away from us, but towards another route to go to the top of the block so he could cut us off. I grabbed Sarah by the wrist quite hard, and pulled her behind me as fast as I could. This is when we heard him yell. I won't hurt you if you let me fuck her! I shoved my other hand over Sarah's mouth, so the man couldn't hear her sobbing. Thank God he turned the corner to the other side of the block, giving us just enough time to rush by. When the man realized we'd slipped past him, he became even more furious. He started searching frantically for us. Being city streets, there were not many good places to hide. I was not trying to stray from our path, because getting lost around here with this guy was not an option. So many things were going through my head as we ran. Who was this guy? How had he managed to follow us? And better yet, how had he managed to get ahead of us in the first place? We ran until we reached the next train station. It was completely empty. Once we caught our breath, I checked the train schedule. By now, the time was 12.05, so the next train out wasn't for 30 minutes. This gave us no comfort, for the guy had found us before. If he found us now, we'd have nowhere to go. Sarah and I stayed silent hiding out of view as best we could. I held her in my arms, trying to calm her down. We sat there on the floor alone. The silence turned every slight noise into the monster of a man we now hid from. Just as the train finally rolled into sight, I could see him, there, walking down the stairs to our platform. We stayed hidden as we saw him get on the train. Once we knew which car he was on, we ran a few cars down and sat slightly hidden. We had four stops to go. Each one, of course, gave us time to freak ourselves out even more, wondering if he'd seen us and if we would be followed off the train. At this time, as soon as I could get my connection, I called my dad telling him he needed to get to the station as soon as he could, and I explained the whole situation. My father's a good man, so we understood and came right away. 
As the train pulled into the station, we booked it off and down the stairs to the bottom floor. This is when we heard the man again, now clearly chasing us down the stairs and gaining on us every moment. We'd just made it out the doors without being had by the man. When he saw my dad's car waiting, he took off the other way. We never filed any reports because there was nothing the police could actually do for us. This happened just over two years ago, and it seriously made me rethink camping alone. I was with two friends this time, and I worry about what would have happened if I was by myself. Two friends and myself, like I'd previously stated, were on a cross-country trip, and Roswell, New Mexico was one of our stops. We were there for the kitsch, but we were also camping for most of the trip, so we got a site at Bottomless Lake State Park about 20 minutes outside of the city. We did our thing in town for the day and headed back to our site around sundown. Everything seemed fairly standard at first. There were some neighbors camping down the road, and we could hear their music playing. The moldy peaches, it seemed. Pretty light-hearted soundtrack, which didn't set the creepiest of tones. My two friends, who were a couple, read and wrote in their journals by lantern light, whilst I drank a couple of beers while taking long exposure photographs of our campsites. The music finally died down after a while. My friends got tired and went to sleep, and after I got the shot I wanted, I did too. I awoke fairly disoriented, somewhere in that state of transition from light to deep sleep. I could hear crunching all around my tent, not knowing if I was dreaming or not. I just kind of sat upright to try and figure out if what I was hearing was real or just the remnants of sleep. I started to hear it again, this time much closer. The sound wasn't just closer, it was directly outside of my tent now. Understandably, the hair on the back of my neck was poker straight, and I knew something was up. There was a moment that I thought this must have been a ranger or something. Who knows, maybe our registration had been messed up or we'd left the headlights on for the car or something. I called out. Uh, if someone is there, can you please make your presence known? Nothing. Hello? Uh, please identify yourself. Nothing. I sat there, frozen in the most intense sense of fright I'd ever felt. It was dead silent. I calmed myself to lay back down, hoping I'd just been imagining things and closed my eyes. Within the next five minutes, though, the footsteps started circling around my tent. I shot back up. I knew someone was out there. At this point, something so surreal happened. I can't even adequately express how frightened I was. As I sat there, open-mouthed and silent, the end of my tent started to be lifted up by the person outside. I screamed for my friends in their tent. I screamed for them to wake up and that someone was outside. It felt so hectic. My friends were disoriented. I was disoriented too, and from then on I didn't see or hear anything else. My friend was basically yelling at me to stick my head out of my tent and check it out, but I was absolutely terrified that if I did I'd suddenly get my head chopped off by someone waiting there or have a gun stuck into my face. Finally, I worked up the balls to look. Nothing. No one. We got out of the tents and into the car, and I told them everything. They seemed concerned, yet fairly skeptical. I was adamant something had happened, though. We decided to shine our headlamps from the car in the direction of our tents. They were surrounded by these rocky hills and a dried-up riverbed. As we scanned the rocks with our lights, another light hit the rocks right behind our tents. We decided at that point it would probably be a good idea to leave our shit, get a motel room, and take off out of there. We headed to Roswell at about midnight. That entire night I felt kind of stupid actually. I was also really scared of course. I kept trying to tell myself it was just a dream, or it had just been a raccoon or something. I'd seen too many horror movies obviously. We kind of joked about it, watching cops on the shitty motel TV, and fell asleep. We went back in the morning, and unfortunately my fears were confirmed. At first we rolled up and nothing seemed to be out of place. Nothing stolen or moved, or so it initially seemed. We started picking up our things and I began to take my tarp off. My friend called out to me. 
Well, that's just fucking weird. He signaled me over. The elastic bungee cords that hold the rain fly on his tent had been cut clean through with scissors or a knife. The tent was brand new. I went back over to mine to see if I had the same and was immediately drawn to a circle of fresh boot prints around my tent. Boot prints that were on top of mine. With that being said, we packed up and did it quite fast. We almost didn't even really talk about it. I actually even think that my friend who got his tent cut open was still a bit skeptical. I can't say for certain who the person was or what they were trying to do, but they certainly achieved the goal of scaring the shit out of me. 